Good afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets and this latest non-farm payrolls webcast with me, Michael Hewson, on Friday the 5th of July. And this look at likely market moves in the wake of the June payrolls report. And this is going to be a very eagerly awaited payrolls report. Before I get started, just do a brief risk warning. I won't be giving any um, trading advice or where to buy or where to sell in this particular video is purely for educational purposes and to try and draw some conclusions as to the potential direction of the market in the event we don't get the market numbers that an awful lot of people are expecting over the course of the next half hour. So while I just allow you to digest uh, these the, these risk warnings um, I will look forward to what the market's expecting what markets are expecting the Fed will likely do at the end of this month and whether or not the market is correct in its assessment that the Federal Reserve will be cutting rates on the 30th of July when they meet for the latest FOMC meeting. Now, it's no secret that President Trump has been banging on at uh, uh, Jay Powell for having US interest rates too high, but by the, in the same breath, he's also claiming that the US economy is the best, market stock, best economy in the world, the stock market is the best barometer of that economy, and yet he still thinks that the Fed needs to cut rates. Well, I don't, it doesn't need me to basically articulate the fact that he's slightly contradicting himself there. If he's got the best con economy in the world, he doesn't really need to cut rates. But that being said, the markets are certainly pushing on the Fed to cut rates at the end of this month. And really, I think the main, the main unknown, I think, is not about whether or not the Fed will cut rates. I think that they will by the end of this year. The big question is about timing. Now, a month ago, I sat here and talked to you guys about my scepticism about the fact as to whether or not the Federal Reserve would cut rates in July. Since then, market expectations for a Fed rate cut in July have gone from 75-80% probability of a cut and this is the WIRP screen that um, I was telling you all about just over a month ago. And what this tells you is that at the July meeting, so July the 31st, 2019, there is a 100% probability, or the market is implying, that the, there is a 100% probability that the Fed will cut rates at the end of this month. Now. The big question, as far as the market is concerned, is whether or not that will be a cut from 225 to 2.5%, which is the current Fed funds rate, to 2 to 2.25. And the market is assigning a 78.5% probability that we'll get a 25 basis point rate cut. But it's also assigning a 21.5% probability that we'll get a rate cut of 50 basis points, not 25, 50 um, to 1.75 to 2%. So that's the narrative at the moment. The narrative is not whether or not we get a rate cut, but whether or not we get a 50 basis point rate cut or a 25 basis point rate cut. Now, my view is, um, and it's not a view that's universally shared, is that the US doesn't need a rate cut at this point in time. And if it prepared to cut rates um, when unemployment is at 3.6% um, and wage growth is currently trending at around about 3.2%. There is something badly wrong um, with people's perceptions about risk. Um, but at the moment, the market is pushing on that narrative and that is what's helping drive stock markets higher. Lower rates, higher stock markets. And that's why you've seen a big breakout this week, not only in US markets, which have pushed up to new record highs, but what we've also seen 
is European markets also break out towards the top side. So I'm targeting two levels at the moment on US markets. The first level is the 3000 level. Um, first, the, the first is the 3000 level. So that's going to be a key resistance level. And in answer to your question, yes, 25 basis points is already priced in. The big question is, is whether or not 50 is priced in. So 25 basis points is baked into the price, which means you're going to need a very, very disappointing number um, to um, prompt that to move out to 50 basis points. Now, we've not just got US payrolls today. We've also got Canadian payrolls as well. So as I say, we've got a plethora of data dropping. Um, so we'll be needing to pay particular attention to that when the numbers drop. I'm digressing slightly. 3,000 on the S&P is likely to be a very key psychological level. When we talk about technical analysis and we talk about the psychology of trading, round numbers tend to have or tend to act as key significant resistance levels. So 3,000 on the S&P um, and 27,000 on the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So those are two key resistance levels. And ultimately what we would need to happen is if one or other of those breaks to the top side, the likelihood is that it'll be a false break. However, if they both break to the upside, then it's more likely to be the likelihood that we'll see a sustained move higher. For the, for the moment, for the here and now, I've, I'm very, very sceptical that we're probably going to see much more in the way of upside ahead of the weekend. Why? Simply for two reasons. We've already broken to record highs already. US investors, a good proportion of US investors are likely to be taking a long weekend after the 4th of July holiday. And as a result, you may find that while um, moves may be much more choppy, there's probably likely to be much less momentum behind them. So while you may get a spike towards the upside, I th think it's unlikely that it's, it's going to be sustained. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that we won't see a break higher in the days and weeks ahead. Certainly, if the data deteriorates, there is a good chance that might happen. But the one thing that's really, I think, making me an awful, very, very cautious about these moves higher in US markets is what the, the small cap index is doing, the Russell 2000. And while the S&P and the Dow have been making new record highs, if we look at the small cap index, which is a much closer barometer, <coughs> excuse me, of the US economy, it hasn't really been tracking the main indices higher. So we really do need to keep an eye on this trend line from the highs that we saw in August, September 2018 to this level here. I'm monitoring that very, very closely because we're seeing significant divergence between the small cap 2000 and the main US indices. So I've just been asked a question about the panels on how I have on the screen showing the non-farm payrolls. The easiest way to create those panels, sir, is to go to the market calendar, which is in the market polls drop down, and then just basically select them as an option here in the alerts column so that when the data comes out, it acts as a reminder. So you can see here with these bells that I have marked Canadian employment, average earnings, wages, non-farm payrolls and the unemployment rate. So every month that comes around because that's a recurring alert, 15 minutes before the alert comes out, it will pop up on the screen in a panel like so. So go into calendar from Market Pulse drop down and then select the item that you want to warn you when there's an economic announcement coming out. You will then get the countdown clock ahead of the announcement and that will act as a reminder to you that if you want to close out any positions or pare down any positions ahead of that number, you can do so ahead of the data. Hopefully that answers your question. So every client can do that um, who has access to the economic calendar within the platform. So that's Market Pulse, Markets Calendar. And then, then just select the options as an alert. So hopefully that answers your question. So let's have a quick look at the key levels on the 
um, European markets. And we can see here we've broken out to the top side here. 12,450 was the key resistance level there. We've broken to the top side. And we also need to be aware of what the European Central Bank um, is likely to do over the course of the next month or so as well, because they meet on the 25th of July. And with the appointment, well, not the appointment, but certainly the putting forward of IMF Chairman Christine Lagarde as new ECB president to replace Mario Draghi, the likelihood is that the ECB is likely to become an awful lot more dovish um, over the course of the next few months. And there is a TLTRO starting um, in September, a new, a new form of lending programs for the ECB to inject money into the Eurozone economy. We've seen bond yields in Europe slide lower. The German Bund now is trading at minus 0.4 and yet the dollar is still getting stronger. So, you know, we can argue the case for um, US yields coming off and yet the dollar is still going up doesn't seem to make an awful lot of sense. Well, it does if German Bund yields come off as well, because it's all about the rate differentials. And we can see the rate differential here with the green line on the bottom. I've taken the US 10-year Treasury yield and subtracted it from the German 10-year yield. At the moment, we're trading at around about 2.36%. So the dollar can still go up, even though the Fed is cutting rates, simply because it's the best of a bad bunch. Um, the cleanest dirty shirt, as Muhammad al Aryan once famously said a couple of years ago when he was talking about the attractions of the US dollar over all of the other um, European bonds. Because if you actually look at where U US rates are, they're much, much higher than in Europe, where there is around about 25% of the European bond, or at least 50% of the European bond market, which is negative, which is yielding negative territory. Anyway, so key level 12,450 on the German DAX. I think we'll struggle to take out the highs that we saw earlier this week. Same applies to the FTSE 100. We're seeing a little bit of a sell off ahead of the numbers. Maybe the expectation is there'll be a good number and you'll start to price out the prospect of a 50 basis point rate hike 50 basis point rate hike, 50 basis point rate cut um, at the end of this month. The market is leaning in that direction. Personally, I think that's mistaken. And it also depends an awful lot on the voting patterns of Fed policymakers. And there's only one Fed policymaker who suggested that he's in a favour of cutting rates, and that's James Bullard. And I'll talk a little bit about the FOMC voting panel after the payrolls numbers break, because I think in terms of the narrative that comes out of them, that'll be important in the context of how much the Fed cuts rates in July, if in fact it does. Let's look at the numbers. OK, quickly have a look at dollar CAD because that's going to be particularly important given the fact we've got the Canadian jobs report and we've also got the Bank of Canada meeting next week as well. The Bank of Canada is unlikely to follow the Fed by cutting rates over the course of the next two months. The Canadian economy has been fairly strong. Jobs market has been fairly robust. We saw unemployment drop to 5.4% last month in the Canadian economy, um, which is the lowest it's been for quite some time. And we're expecting a fairly decent number, a positive number for Canada jobs. We can see what we're expecting on Canada jobs today. This is also the wages numbers for so a, a decent beat on the US average earnings is likely to be dollar positive. But having said that, a weak headline number could actually offset a good wages number. So at the moment, the narrative for today, I think, is if we get a poor headline number, you may get a little bit of downside in U.S. Treasury yields. But I don't think you're going to see a significant amount of upside in stock markets because an awful lot of it's already priced in. Uh, and that being said, um, you, you, may, you actually may find that you get caught out from the other side of it. So. 160,000, anything over 170, 180,000 is going to be slightly dollar positive and probably slightly risk negative. Having said that, also a very decent average earnings number is also going to be slightly risk negative as well, which means you could get a little bit of weakness in the stock market. So let's have a quick look at Euro dollar. That continues to look a little bit soggy, but again, we're looking at around about uh, just below currently where we are at the moment, around about 112.40, 112.50. 
as a key support area. Um, and on the cable, roughly around where we are now, 125.30, 125.40, as a little bit of a support level on the downside. So, as I say, keep an eye on the headline number, but do be aware that there could be an offset on the wages numbers. So let's get set. 3.7, the unemployment rate still 224. 224, strongly positive on terms of the headline number, but the wages numbers 3.1, 3.2. So, again, wages slightly weaker than expected. Canada slightly weaker than expected, um, which is likely to probably be, again, a bit of a mixed report. But I would argue that actually that is probably slightly dollar positive, slightly yield negative on the back of that because it would suggest that the US jobs market still remains fairly robust and doesn't really support the case for a rate cut. Um, something that I've consistently said for the past two or three months, the rate cut narrative has been one that's really been pushed by politicians and less by Federal Reserve officials. So what does that mean? Well, basically, it means that the, you're going to get pressure on the downside in euro dollar and sterling dollar. No change there. You're going to get slightly upward pressure on dollar yen. So we'll have a quick look at dollar yen right now. Well, I just open this chart up. Here we go. So we're probably going to go and retest these peaks that we saw um, earlier this month actually last week so you're looking at around about 108.60 108.70.80 that's always been the key level on dollar yen um, if you look at these series of highs all the way through here you've got a series of peaks through there and there so i think that number suggests that we're probably going to get a little bit more upside in dollar yen heading towards the peaks that we saw last week just to get rid of the breaking news alert for non-farm payrolls but all in all, there's nothing in those numbers that's going to break us out of the range that we've been in over the course of the past few weeks and months. So fairly good number, ladies and gentlemen, fairly good number. Um, wages slightly weaker. So the argument for a 50 basis point rate cut is no longer there. You're probably going to see that number come out on Fed interest rate expectations. And as a result, I think the dollar upside here is probably likely to be fairly limited. Um, until we get slightly more data, but certainly pay attention to um, Fed policymakers over the course of the, the next month or so. So looking at euro dollar, we we'll probably could well see a retest of the 50 day moving average to around about 112.30, uh, 112.40. I don't foresee it going much lower in the short to medium term because those numbers, they've got some downsides and they've got some upsides. The unemployment rate has ticked higher to 3.7%. Now, that could be merely a symptom of the participation rate edging a little bit higher as more people come back into the workforce. And if I just quickly look at my Bloomberg, I can actually confirm whether or not that is in fact the case. And it is in fact the case. The participation rate has just edged up to 62.9%. So the unemployment rate hasn't really moved that much. We've got a slightly lower revision in the main number from 75,000 to 72,000. So nothing much to see there. Slightly weaker wage growth um, than expected, but it was just, it was unchanged from the, pe the previous month. So what these numbers are telling me is that 50 basis point rate cut is not on the table. And really, um, the 25 basis point rate cut argument is starting to lose a little bit of momentum as well, which could mean that you may find that US Treasury yields could start to edge back higher again. You're certainly seeing that early on. The US 10-year Treasury is edging up a little bit. It's now around about 1.98%. And I'll be close, paying close attention next week to um, the comments of various Fed policymakers. So let's talk about Fed policymakers because I think what they say over the course of the next few weeks and months, or certainly the next few weeks, is going to be vitally important. So if we look at this, the Fed website here, we've got the 2019 committee members. So we've got James Bullard. He voted for a 25 basis point rate cut in June. Now he's unlikely to resile from that um, between now and the end of the month. And a lot of water can flow under the bridge, economically speaking, between now and the 30th of July. You've also got the small matter 
of the European Central Bank rate meeting, which happens a week before the Fed on the 25th of July. And it's quite conceivable that the ECB could cut the deposit rate even further from minus 0.4% to minus 0.6%. The Swiss already have lower rates than that. So James Bullard, he's probably going to vote for a rate cut. But on the flip side of that, Esther George is unlikely to vote for a rate cut. So these two cancel each other out. Richard Clarida, who's Fed Vice Chair, has been consistent in his approach that they will monitor the data. Based on that report that we've seen today, I can't see the case for a rate cut. So they might find themselves bullied into one. And James Bullard has certainly suggested that he wants to see a 25 basis point cut and then that's it. Um, but he, the, you're going to need other Fed members to come out and be fairly explicit in terms of their support for a July rate cut. So the one I would be paying particular attention to over the course of the next few days um, or the next couple of weeks are Charles Evans because he has a tendency to lean towards the dovish side and as recently as May he said that he didn't see the rationale for a rate cut and that the markets were seeing something that maybe he perhaps wasn't. So he's given himself wriggle room one way or the other to support a rate cut but he said he, he hasn't seen it based on the data at this point in time and that's a very important distinction to make sometimes you really do have to dig behind the narrative to really find out what fed policy makers are thinking and at the moment the risk at the moment is geared more towards the fed not doing anything and going in september rather than um, going for a 25 basis point cut in july so next week we have a number of fed speakers who are due to be speaking and I will be paying particular attention to what they might have to say with respect to not only this payrolls report but certainly I think um, so certainly I think in terms of whether or not they think the likelihood of a rate cut has gone up or gone down. Eric Rosengren from the Boston Fed is also tends to lean slightly more hawkish than dovish. Jay Powell, again, he's, he's one member, but Leo Brainerd is probably another member who might lean more to the dovish side than the hawkish side. But again, these, 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 these members here are the ones you need to listen to. We've heard recently from Loretta Mester, um, who says she doesn't see the case for a rate cut, um, but she's not a voting member this year. Neil Kashkari, he's very dovish, he's not a voting member. Kaplan, not a voting member. Harker, not a voting member. So what they say is not really going to influence the final vote when it comes to the Fed meeting. Anyway, I've digressed long enough. Sometimes I just wanted to get that point across that it's important to listen to what Fed policymakers say. And my view on this is that the risks of the Fed not acting is the real downside risk at the moment for markets. Uh, and we could see a spike in yields from the lows that we're currently seeing um, and that in essence could actually push equity markets back down because equity markets have risen over the course of the past two weeks based on a single premise that the Fed is going to ease in July and this last gasp move here I think was based on the prospect that we could see a 50 basis point rate cut. Don't think that is going to happen and really now it's a question of 25 basis points or no rate cut at all. Let's not also forget that the Fed is still reducing the size of its balance sheet. So any rate cut in July will be partially offset by the shrinkage of its balance sheet, which is due to end in September. So there is a little bit of push-pull going on in terms of monetary policy. So if they do cut rates in July, they'll probably end the balance sheet reduction early as well. So um, as I say, that is, that is, that is the downside risk. The downside risk is that the markets have overpriced the prospect of a Fed rate cut. So let's have a quick look at Dollar Canada. Please feel free to fire questions across at me um, because ultimately um, that is what I'm here for, to answer your questions um, with respect to where I think or our markets are going. Certainly that Canadian jobs report has given a nice little uplift to dollar CAD, as I suspected it might. So it looks to me as if we could potentially move higher 
towards these peaks that we saw at the, at the in the middle of last week, around about 131.50, 131.40, 131.50. Um, if we take that down to the four-hour chart, we can see we can see those peaks there, which has been seeing a slow decline uh, in the U.S. dollar, gains in the Canadian dollar, a slightly weak jobs report this month for the for, for Canada, but it's a very modest decline, a very modest decline, and to my mind, it really doesn't matter that much in the wider scheme of things because the Canadian jobs report tends to be a little bit tends to be a little bit flaky anyway and, and most of that decline in the Canadian jobs report was down to a decline in part-time employment rather than any significant decline in um, full-time employment which saw a gain of 24.1 24,000 24,000 full-time jobs were added in June and 26,000 part-time jobs were lost so that headline number is probably not as negative as it looks at first glance. Um, f furthermore, if we actually look at the unemployment rate for the Canadian economy, it has, it has edged ever so slightly higher to 5.5%, but that's still a fairly low level. So um, the pressure is for a slight move higher in the dollar CAD, but let's not forget that next week we also have the Bank of Canada rate meeting, which is, at, which is up on the 10th. And that does come against a backdrop of an improving Canadian economy. So um, we could see that start to drift back towards 132 over the course of the next couple of days, based on a little bit of short covering ahead of the Bank of Canada rate meeting. I've been asked to take a look at the um, pound against the dollar. So I'll quickly do that now. I mean, this this looks really weak, and even more so now in the wake of that that U.S. jobs report. Um, at the moment, sterling hasn't got an awful lot going for it, um, from an economic point of view, or from a technical point of view, for that matter. The big level that I'm targeting at the moment is this around about 125, 20, 125, 30. We've got these series of lows through here, and if we go all the way back, it's really, really messy. Um, it's not something that um, I would be particularly keen to trade at this point in time because of all the Brexit headlines that are surrounding this, cu this currency. But what I would say is the bias is towards the downside, further sterling weakness. All this talk about the Bank of England saying the next move in rates is higher is it's poppycock in my opinion. Um, I think it's much more likely that we will see um, a rate cut. Um, you look at the recent data that we've seen, while it's no worse than um, some of the data that we've seen out of the Europe, it's it's no better either. And with all of the uncertainty going on with respect to whether or not we get a no-deal Brexit, the Conservative Party leadership contest, the uncertainty about um, you know where the economy goes now as we head towards the autumn, I think it's going to take something clearly significant to really push the pound up. You know, and, and I think that's that's really I think that's really the be all and end all at the moment. It's Brexit everything, and Brexit is acting as a drag that's dragging the pound lower. So for me, I think if you're trading the, the pound against the dollar, it's a sell the rally type trade. You know, look to get short around about 126.30, 126.40 with a tight stop, and if we do go back to around about 127 and a half, as you can see with that horizontal line that I've drawn through there. That's a big, big barrier, and we really knew, do need to get a significant move back above that to try and stabilise the pound and push it back higher again. Um, so um, I don't think it really matters who the new PM is going to be. Obviously, if any new PM does lead us in the direction of a slightly softer Brexit, then that's likely to be mildly sterling positive, but that's not going to happen without a new election. And I can't really see a new election solving anything. So I think between now and the end of the year, we could get a new election. We'll get another hung parliament. How that hung parliament looks is anybody's guess, given the fact that the support bases of both the Conservative Party and the Labour Party are imploding. And it's really just a question of either how well the Lib Dems do and how well the Brexit Party do, assuming that they stand candidates in every single Westminster seat. So um, thoughts on crypto are... 
wouldn't touch it with a barge pole. It's way too volatile for me. But if you want me to talk about crypto, quite happy to. Um, we've got Bitcoin, which is continuing to push higher. Certainly in a very nice uptrend. But, you know, with the spreads that we have on crypto, it's a little bit, how shall we say, on the rich side. At the moment, the spread on crypto is 37 pips. So at a pound a point, that's 37 pounds. Um, the margin is quite high, but certainly the direction of travel is towards the upside with a fairly decent support in and around 10, 9 and 10,000. If, however, you want to sort of dilute, shall we say, how shall I say, if you want to dilute your exposure to crypto across, um, say, for example, a slightly wider variety of assets, you could always go and do a crypto index bet for example. So we have something called the Major Crypto Index, um, which basically is an amalgamation of all the five main cryptocurrencies, obviously heavily weighted towards Bitcoin, which is 40% of the Major Crypto Index. Um, Ethereum is about around about 20%. So 60% of the Major Crypto Index is Bitcoin and Ethereum and that does dilute some of the volatility that you see in some of the major moves particularly in Bitcoin. Um, so as I say we've, we've added um, a number two three new crypto indexes to our crypto offering. Um, you've got the all crypto index up there, you've got the major crypto index um, down there and you've got the emerging crypto index which again is an amalgamation of all the minor ones like Cardano Dash, EOS, um, and so on and so forth. So it's something that you can have a look at uh, at your leisure. If you have any questions on that, obviously contact our customer service desk. They will be more than happy to help you in that regard. Um, have, let's have a quick look at WTI and uh, gold for um, our other clients. And again, I think with, with oil, again, it's one of those things about you know, buy the rumor, sell the fact. OPEC have announced the production cuts or the production caps for another nine months. But again, it's less about the OPEC's ability to cut production. If they cut too much, what they do is they just open up the prospect of the US shale producers stealing their lunch. So for me, the major story around crude oil is not so much supply as demand. It's a demand story. And the failure this week to move above $59, $60 a barrel on WTI shifts the onus for me to a sell the rally type move. Obviously, that is the Middle East, Middle East going up in flames notwithstanding. Um, the risk, I think, is with respect to crude. If we look at this chart, we're getting lower highs, lower lows. And until such times as we take out this trend line here on WTI, again, it's very much sell the rally in terms of crude oil unless demand picks up. Now we've got China trade next week. That could give us an indication as to where we are with respect to demand, but I don't expect an awful lot. And one of the th key things that has happened over the course of the past few weeks or past couple of weeks is the breakout in gold prices. Obviously that, that figure that we saw, payrolls figure, is is slightly negative for gold because it reduces slightly the prospect of a rate cut or a 50 basis point rate cut in any case at the end of this month and as a result you're seeing gold slip back the key level for me in gold you can see it on the chart there it's as clear as day it's 1380 that was the key level on the upside it was the 38.2 retracement of the entire down move that i've highlighted here and these series of highs through here as well so it's a really, really big level. You've got this high in the 2016, 2017, 2018. We've broken above it and we haven't gone back below it. So with respect to gold prices, as long as we're above 1380, then we're likely to see another test of 1440 and a potential break higher. So at the moment, um, we're chopping around in a range for gold prices. The lower part of that range is 1380. If we drop below 1370, then we could drop back to around about 1350. But very much, I think, with gold, by the dip. Um, and Bitcoin, I've covered as well. 
Um, been asked about how one gets the Bloomberg LP screen. Well, you have to, uh, sadly, you have to sign up for Bloomberg. Um, I'm fortunate and I have access to one, um, but they're not cheap. So um, there you are. Unless you have a Bloomberg subscription, you're not going to be able to gain access to one. Um, does anyone else have any questions on anything that we've covered so far on this webinar? In fact, I've actually slightly overrun, So, but I'm hopeful that I've covered everything that I need to cover. And just a reminder, we'll be back 2nd of August for um, the July payrolls report. And obviously that will come in the wake of any Fed decision. So that could be particularly interesting um, payrolls particularly if the Fed doesn't cut rates. So with that bombshell, as they used to say on Top Gear, unless anyone else has any questions, um, I'd like to wrap that up. And thank you all for listening. Hope you all enjoy a lovely sunny weekend. And I will speak to you all same time, same place in a month's time. Thank you very much for listening.